right side, arms numb, speech slurred. He's incoherent. Okay, initiate code stroke, call some. What's going no, on? What's okay, wrong with him? Don't push me away! Ma'am, I'm not pushing you away. Your husband has had a stroke. You need to make a plan, and we need to do it very fast. It was admitted last night. Ptosis. They paged me to take a look. What's his history? Uh, living on the streets for at least five years. And it... In and out of psych wards, no family. It's purple and bulbous. He was previously diagnosed with schizophrenia. I see government. There you are. Government. It's been going on and on about how the CIA put extra salt on his french fries to dehydrate him. And uh, what did the Supreme Court do? They killed Stevie Ray Vaughan. Okay. Oh my God. Mr. Carter? Huh? How long has your eyelid been drooping like this? I, I can hear you. Yeah, I know. I know it's going fans. May I? I'm not CIA, sir. How long has he been in here? He comes and goes, sometimes for a day or two, depending on the severity of his psychosis. Let's get an MRI. Oh, he's not insured. Not that that matters. White ones. It's always about the white ones. I think, yeah, that's right. I, I, I can hear you. Yet again, barred an instrument rep from the OR because in defiance of our express the directives. Procedures. They exalt in defiance the interest of the hardware policy, of the patient. In defiance of me. Oh, well, it's all about you, isn't it, Buck? You listen to me, Missy. Missy. How oh, lovely to see the children at play. <laughs> Dr. Ridgway, let me start with you. I have delightful news. You won't have to worry about attorney Tompkins complicating your life, at least not for the immediate future. The case has gone away. Really? How? Our attorney deemed it unwinnable, so we've settled. I beg your pardon? Well, that's what happens when you nick the olfactory nerve of a chef. Or rather, when you delegate the nicking of said nerve to a resident with no previous experience of the procedure. Oh, and you can wipe that smile off your face, Buck. The attorney has set his sights on you now. Me? Why? Something to do with your insistence on pronouncing a rather alive patient dead. You'll be meeting with our lawyer first, Scott Henderson. He's waiting for you on the third floor. Raj occlusion there, about the plaque. Middle cerebral artery, swelling, need hemicraniectomy. I'm sorry, I didn't understand a word he said. Your husband needs surgery to relieve the pressure on his brain. The sooner we do it, the more brain cells we can save. He had a massive stroke. Medications, thromboridics already given. And what's a hemi... Craniectomy, remove part of the skull bone, create a flap. What do you mean, flap? Only one entrance into skull. Hole at the base. If no room, brain squish out the hole. What is he talking about? The brain is swelling, so we need to create more room. So we remove part of the skull. And do what with it? Stomach. We store the skull bone in the abdomen. The peritoneum in the belly actually nourishes the skull bone, keeps it healthy while he recovers. Um, the operation, is it risky? Yes, ma'am. We'll die without. Oh, my God. Oh, promise me you'll save him. Please. I will do. If no room, brain squish out hold. Wow. So all this time they've been thinking it's schizophrenia when that has been growing inside his head. Perhaps growing for five plus years. It's a bilobed meningioma. It's on your frontal lobes. Now the good news is I might be able to fix it with surgery, but there are risks. Better get a DDM interconnections. The ISA alleviates post delay. Reduces routing issues. Yeah. I'll take care of the routing issues. In the meantime, please, sign here. It says that you understand the inherent risks. The soft switch architecture is not right. It's just as right. Absolutely, please. Sign here. It says that you understand the risks of surgery and that you knowingly consent to the procedure. You want to scrub up, be part of this? I would. But I know it isn't my place to raise this concern. If you have a concern, doctor, it's your duty to raise it. OK, the consent. Was anything but informed. The man had no idea what I was talking about. 
But with no family, no guardian, I'd either have to go to court, which could take time he does not have, given the size of the meningioma, or I simply get another neuro who will agree that the surgery is as necessary as it is urgent. Are you that neuro, Dr. Robidoff? Um, yes. Good, then. Scrub up. So you're not getting sued now. This is great. No, it's bad, because I've lost even before being allowed to defend myself. Look, we get sued. Big deal. It happens. Be glad you now don't have to deal with Mitch Tompkins. OK, you are way too mellow. How great was this date with Lieberman? Oh, not get pitched. We did, son, which is why we're on our way to see you. Walk Risha. He's urgent. Stroke patient. Hemicraniectomy. Need you. And you, patient old, fat. Scrub? OK, yeah. Gang banger gets shot in the head by another banger, and the family is suing me, the doctor. Welcome to American jurisprudence. What, do you think that's funny? I didn't intend it as funny. Mr. Tompkins sues doctors in bulk and typically extracts owners' settlements. More times than not, we get a defendant to make incriminating or worse, dumb declarations on the record, and to first impressions count, you strike me as low-hanging fruit. Have you ever been deposed by Mr. Tompkins before? No, but I can certainly handle The answer to that question would be no. You leave it at no. You do not qualify, elaborate, or explain. The more you say, the more you pay. This has been my experience with Mitch Tompkins. OK. Mr. Carter, how we doing? I know. I'm sorry? I know that you're CIA, and you're trying to cut these secrets out of my head. You just try to relax, OK? I'll make you better. I want my lawyer. Oh, what did he say? He said, let's do it. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with what I just heard. That's not what I got from the pre-op eval. Uh, ho hold on, everybody. Let's all take a moment while Dr. Wong gets himself comfortable. Maybe in the meantime, we could all watch a little TV. I direct your attention to the monitor featuring a large bilobed meningioma, one which needs to come out of the head. Look, I have assessed this patient, doctor, and found him to lack any comprehension of his medical condition, and therefore incapable of expressing informed consent. There is no alternative source for such consent. It therefore falls to me to weigh the risks of performing the proposed treatment versus not performing. My medical opinion is that this tumor needs to come out. Do you really mean to substitute your judgment for mine, Dr. Wong? No. Good, then. Please, put him to sleep. CIA. It's the CIA, and there's so many CIA. And when you have... Yeah, it's... I'm telling you, one glass of wine went from Keith to Cyrano de Bergerac. Shh. No talk. That's high school. Was I being loud? I didn't think so. Shh. I stand corrected. You ready? Yeah, bring it here, babe. Suture. Forceps. You doing okay? Me? I feel like I'm at Disneyland. You ever had a tumor in both hemispheres before? Once. This is rare. You ready? Well, first of all, let me say, and I'll even say it for the record, I happen to be a big proponent of organ donation. I have a brother-in-law who would not be alive today but for our organ donation network. So to the extent that you are a participant in this process, and I know you are as head of transplants at Chelsea General, let me start off by offering a heartfelt thank you. I should also like to mention for the record that when a life is lost, many, many people suffer. The victim himself, the family, hospital staff, even the doctors. Am I right, Dr. Tierney? Has my client's loss of life caused you to suffer any? 
I, like you, am pained by any loss of life, Mr. Tompkins. My pain here is mitigated by the reality that through the gift of transplants, other lives were saved. How very well said. And I am heartened, I must say, to see you have your own personal suffering in check. Shall we turn to my client's suffering, then? He taking any breaths on his own? None. I haven't given him anything for a bit. But he's not lightening up. No neuromuscular blockade on board? Not for a while. And no pain response. He's got decerebral posture. How's his entitled CO2? Normal. Bring down more. Has he had any mannitol diuretics? Max dosage, steroids too. Can you buy him some more room? No. No? There's too much edema. Malignant brain edema. He's herniated his brain stem. Fixed and dilated. What was his Glasgow coma scale to start? Seven. He's only three now. Three's look and go. Caloric reflex? Ice water. No ocular vestibular reflexes. Sweating could not be contained. Press on other parts of brain. He's dead. He's... He's brain dead. Yes. He's on a ventilator. His body is still working. But I'm afraid he's gone. We are so sorry. He's... A ventilator? He, he's on a machine? Yes. Well, he didn't want a machine. That's why we filled out all that paperwork, the directive. The advanced directive doesn't actually apply during surgery. He's really dead. Okay. He's gone. How can he be gone? Because we can cut the night short if... I'm okay. That poor woman. They had no children. He was all she had. What? What are you thinking? Nothing. That isn't true. You were looking at me funny and thinking something. It wasn't anything appropriate. Second date, we're already keeping stuff from each other. I guess that means we're fast-tracked. Okay. I have been hoping all day that tonight I would be kissing you. And what I was thinking just now is how that's probably not going to happen. I told you, not appropriate. Are you okay? Somebody help! Are you getting air okay? Ma'am? Ma'am? Hold on, one, one. She's not breathing. Uh, Mr. Carter? Mr. Carter? How are we doing? I'm uh, Dr. Wilson. I performed the procedure. What procedure? You had a large tumor on either side of your frontal lobe. Do you have any memory of meeting me before? And uh, this is Dr. Robido. She assisted me with the procedure. How are you doing? Well, I, I think we're still trying to figure that out. OK, Mr. Carter, for tonight, I just want you to rest, OK? We'll go over everything tomorrow. Miss Cooper. I'm sorry? Well, my name is Brian Cooper. Uh, you were admitted as James Earl Carter. Okay, I got no idea who that is, but my name is Brian Cooper. Look, is my wife here? I, I'd really like to talk to my wife. Well, um, we can certainly arrange that if 
Would you happen to know how to contact her? Yeah, you can call her at uh, 503-278-8106. She lives at uh, 1215 Bitterroot Drive in Beaumont. Her name is Marilyn. Sir, are you, are you okay? What year is it? Uh, 2013. What year did you think it was? 2006. What happened to me? What happened to me? Extraordinary woman, Dr. Lepore. Can I be honest? You're overmatched, my man. That woman will run through you like crap through a goose. It's just my opinion, but crap through a goose. Dr. Park? Hi. Fran Horowitz from Risk Management. We've met before. How are we today? Busy. Go away. Of course. This will just take a minute. I understand that you lost a patient yesterday and you're meeting with his wife this morning. Can we talk about that for a second? No. Busy. Well, understanding that you're busy, um, I'd nevertheless like to have a conversation. And in fact, Harding Hooten personally asked me to stop by for a chat. I know you're familiar with the Sorry Coalition and the multitude of studies that show from a risk management perspective a doctor's compassion. Not sorry. Sorry dead, not sorry do. Do nothing wrong. Go. Yes, notwithstanding that the procedure was done correctly from a medical and technical standpoint, studies do show that a doctor's contrition. Not sorry do. Sorry dead, not do. Go away. Yes. Um, why don't I just leave you some information to review? This is a pamphlet created by the Sorry Coalition. Doctors find that it, too, can be very helpful. Keep in mind that family members' primary motive when having these post-mortem conversations is simply ascertaining exactly what happened. Now, if we were to role-play for a second, and I, as Eloise Fernwood, were to ask you, what happened, doctor? Why did my husband die? Your answer might be? Fat. Eat too much bad food. Yes. Um, I'm going to leave you a few more pamphlets. Please, please, please. First, regarding yesterday's session, a heartfelt thank you. I feel much more up to speed. Though uh, a bit conflicted, I must say, given your actions, I have absolutely no doubt that your efforts contributed greatly to the preservation of life. Well done. Now, <clears throat> in going over the transcript, I do have a question. At the time you harvested the organs of my client, Gavin Jasper, how dead was he? How dead was he? This would be my question, yes. He was dead. But you mistakenly thought him dead before, right? Which occasioned him to gesticulate at you? The very reason I had the neuro resident conduct the exam was to confirm the patient's death when it was revealed to me that he was not dead. I left. I returned to harvest the organs only after he had officially been pronounced deceased. Excellent. All cleared up. Wonderful. Except I'm still a bit confused. What constituted Gavin Jasper as dead? After the patient underwent a clinical neurological assessment, he was given what is known as an apnea test. Basically, the ventilator is stopped. You allow the carbon dioxide levels to increase. You check to see whether the patient can breathe or gasp. If he cannot, he is deemed 
brain dead. And that's what happened here? Correct. Mr. Jasper was taken off a ventilator. He did not gasp. He did not breathe. You pronounced him dead. Yes, correct. At which point you put him back on a ventilator and kept alive while you cut out all his organs. No. No? He was not put back on a ventilator? Yes, he was. Why? To keep him dead? To keep his organs alive. See, uh, <laughs> this is where I get confused. Was he dead or alive? He was absolutely dead. His heart had stopped. No, the heart was beating. In fact, he could still have had a heart attack. Yes. How common is that, Doctor, for a dead man to have a heart attack? We are talking about brain dead, okay? Your patient was brain dead. No, he was my client, actually. He was your patient, Doctor. Your patient. When my client was put back on a ventilator, could this have prolonged his suffering? Absolutely not. The pain center of the brain was dead. Well, that's good to know. So there would be no need for, say, an anesthesiologist. The anesthesiologist was there to make sure the parts were properly oxygenated. Wasn't he also making sure that Mr. Jasper wouldn't suffer muscle spasm? Yes. And controlling muscle spasms with anesthesia, isn't that a form of pain management? Just so I'm clear, my dead client, your dead patient whose lungs were breathing, whose heart was beating, had an anesthesiologist present to manage his pain. Your client was not capable of feeling pain. He was brain dead. And you made sure of this, right? Before cutting out his parts. You did an EEG on him to see if there was any activity in his cortex. You tested him for higher brain activity, right? No. You just gave him a little apnea test. Then, whoosh, started removing the kidneys and liver. How dare you? All right, all right. Gee, that was actually my next question. You got all the organ recipients on hand, a school teacher, a doctor, engineer, all these wonderful lives to be saved. A black kid, gunshot to the head. <laughs> what are we waiting for, right? Sure looks dead enough for me. And you have no real memories of the last seven years. Well, I've got a hazy recollection of being either on a street or, a, or an alley. The lab work does indicate some drug abuse. Uh, we were able to locate a Marilyn Cooper. And uh, you have two daughters, Emma and Michaela? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, are, are they here? What? Mr. Cooper, you went missing. A missing persons report was filed in 2006. In 2009, your wife was granted a divorce in absentia. And she's remarried. What? Was I wrong to just blurt it out? Well, it had to be said. Okay, first thing, let's get a counselor in with him. Well, I did make contact with his ex-wife. Uh, she's coming in. Okay, okay. Let me talk to her first. No, 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 no. I do not want this case settled. Absolutely. How much are we looking at? High six figures minimum. What? I didn't fire the gun. I didn't pull the trigger. Buck. We never order up extra tests if they met criteria. I mean, I God, if we double, triple, quadruple check every thug that comes in here with a hole in his head and clinical proof of brain death. This is exactly why we're looking at high sixes. Let alone you hovered over this patient like a vulture waiting for him to die. The fact that he was a black banger only makes it worse. And that you would celebrate the successful harvesting of his organs in front of his mother. I did not celebrate. We saved six lives, for God's sake. Now what, we're gonna get whacked with a lawsuit for that? Are you serious? Do not settle this case, Harding. Thank you, Buck. I will take that under advisement. It's unbelievable. Settle it. We think, um, suffered sequela of his stroke during procedure. Sometimes bad things happen. Uh, did... Uh, were there complications during the procedure? No, it went as planned. 
and two dead. Your husband was not in good physical condition. We try our best, but sometimes these things happen. So I have advanced directive. He not want artificial means. You want disconnect ventilator? Hey! You! Uh-oh. Yeah, uh-oh is right. Did you actually tell Lieberman I would go through him like crap through a goose? In a good way. What is wrong with you? Well, you're too much for that guy. You don't even know him. Yeah, but I know you, Sid. All I was doing was making sure he didn't take you for granted. First of all, what business is it of yours? That, that I protect my people? And by the by, given your track record with men, I stand by my crap through a goose analogy. Dr. Napoa. First off, very well done on saving a life last night. Starting off with the successful, though I have been told, slightly awkward execution of the Heimlich. And then your extraordinary en route intubation and eventual resuscitation, buttoned off finally with your brilliant bypass. What'd I do? I beg your pardon? You got that Monday morning look in your eye. Am I getting 311 Oh, don't be silly. I got the page harding. Does it toll for me? It does not. However, if it were to toll for you... I knew it. What'd I do? Well, you did rather declare yourself last night in the restaurant as a doctor from Chelsea General. In so doing, any subsequent treatment you rendered would potentially incur a liability on the hospital's behalf. We don't like being held accountable for things that transpire in restaurants. Next time, let's just give the lady a big squeeze without the song and dance, shall we? He started to behave erratically both at home and at work. He started drinking, and one day he just never came home. He, he just didn't come back. It hardly seems possible. Yeah, I, I know. In fact, this case will likely get written up in a lot of journals. But in between all the fine print, I'm afraid, will be a great deal of anguish. For him, for you, your children. And how shall I handle this? M Mrs. Cooper. It's cup check now. I'm a neurosurgeon. We're cutters. We open up brains, we resect tumors, we're, we're cutters. And what we've opened up here, I'm afraid, we are not equipped to. But your, your husband, your ex-husband, is meeting with a counselor right now. And my feeling is that, that you should as well, before you see him. And, and how is he? He's... Well, he's very scared. And he's missing you a lot. You and the girls. Okay, as we seem to have a full docket today, let's get started. Uh, Dr. Wilson, oh, there's no need for you to come up, but um, could you tell us about Brian Cooper? Uh... Brian Cooper was a homeless man suffering from delusions who was admitted to the psych ward two nights ago. Suspecting a physical root for his psychosis, I ordered an MRI where it was determined that he was suffering from a benign but large bilobed meningioma. Surgery was performed, the tumor was resected. The delusions have disappeared, and at this point, we're hoping for a full recovery. Wow, I'd call that a miracle, Dr. Wilson. Wouldn't you call that a miracle? I imagine Mr. Cooper must be very excited that such a miracle was performed. Did he strike you as being excited that you performed it? Mr. Cooper lacked any and all competence to provide informed consent. Does he have family? None that we could find, so I made the decision... How hard did you look? I'm sorry? How hard did you look to find this man's family before you subjected him to a life-threatening brain surgery? Hmm. It's difficult sometimes not to rush 
Hmm? When there are great miracles to be had. Did you discuss the matter with any of your colleagues? With Dr. Robidoux. Dr. Robidoux, please stand. Comments? Uh, well, with all due respect, I'm not sure I was even inclined to order up an MRI. The man was homeless, a, a diagnosed schizophrenic with no insurance. As for the procedure itself, he didn't just fail to consent, he refused to give it. In fact, I think he told Dr. Wilson to go F himself. In my opinion, 99 out of 100 doctors would have welcomed the invitation to just walk away. The only reason that Mr. Cooper is healthy, perhaps even alive, is because he got the one surgeon willing to ignore all the bureaucratic BS and just do what was necessary. That would be my comment. With all due respect. Well, that's certainly one way of looking at it. This was certainly a very lucky patient. Not just to get Ty Wilson's gifted neurological hands, but also his legendary ego. After all, his life might have been saved because he just happened on the one doctor who refuses to recognize the possibility that he might ever be wrong. Please take a seat, Dr. Wilson. Buck, do come and join us, please. Actually, I've changed my mind. Go back where you were. Dr. Park, come tell us about Floyd Fernwood. Sixty-two-year-old male, middle cerebral artery occlusion, cold stroke call, performed urgent decompressive hemicraniectomy. Dead. Oh, what was that last bit? Dead. And that's the end of the story, Doctor? Patient died, move on to the next thing, is it? Did you meet with Fran Horowitz from Risk Management, Doctor? Yes. Did you read the pamphlets as provided by the Sorry Coalition? Uh, are you aware of the Sorry Works philosophy, Doctor? Tell us about that philosophy, Dr. Park. Say sorry, patient or family, less likely sue. Stupid. Stupid? Yes. Did nothing wrong, not say sorry. Make no mistake, make no apology. But what exactly did you convey to Mrs. Fernwood after her husband passed? Well, well actually, let's just um, rewind, shall we? Let's go back to, um, let's go all the way back to dead. Did Mr. Fernwood die on the operating table? Brain dead. Put on ventilator. Ventilator disconnect this morning. Now dead dead. Yeah, yeah. Prior to surgery, did Mr. Fernwood have an advanced directive? Yes. And what were his wishes as regards to artificial life-sustaining treatment? No life-sustaining measures if condition irreversible. So how is it that he ended up connected to a ventilator in the face of irreversible coma and brain death? I mean, most of us would recognize that as life-sustaining. I didn't know what the advanced directive said. But no matter, directive no good during surgery anyway. Suspend. Ah, so after surgery, we had a patient who was brain dead hooked up to a respirator. Ask Miss Fernwood what won't do. We then disconnect. Now patient dead dead. Ask Mrs. Fernwood what won't do. Why bother to ask her anything at all? Courtesy. Courtesy? Oh, my giddy aunt. You, I didn't know you had that in your bag of tricks, Doctor. You didn't think to ask before the surgery, as is required? Wouldn't that have been a more appropriate, courteous course of action to take? I'm curious, Doctor. Why do you think people even bother with advance directives? I mean, if one chooses not to be kept alive artificially, why doesn't one just communicate that to family and friends and, and next of kin? Why go to all the trouble of executing a legal document? That seems like such a to-do, does it not? One reason might be to save a loved one from making an excruciating moral decision. You know, I have an advanced directive. Do you know why? Because should I find myself hooked up to a bloody machine one day. I don't want my wife facing a doctor who says to her, what won't do? I don't want my spouse in the terrible position where she has to pull the plug and end the life on the one person she loves most of all. Can you imagine causing such agony to someone, doctor? Buck, you know, I've decided to have a go at you after all. Please come and join us. Oh, you can stay right there, Dr. Park.
I present to you all today the case of the dueling ventilators. Now, we're all in the business of healing, am I right? Ameliorating suffering where and when we can, but suffering sometimes extends beyond the patient to the patient's family. Dr. Park, you looked into the eyes of a grieving widow while her husband was sustained on a machine when you said, what won't do? That was not your best work, Doctor. And Dr. Tierney, you gave us all a grand display only last week in this very room, regaling us all with your life-saving heroics. You were callous. First with Gavin Jasper, then with his mother. You were callous to the point of indecency. And your indecency was again on full display during your deposition. I look around this room, I look around this hospital, and I see such brilliant minds, such gifted hands, all this talent, science, and technology. Why do we need any humanity? It's probably best if you go in alone first. You say he's met with the counselor as well? Yes. Um, I'm not sure if you should go in, at least not yet. I understand. The neurological news is good. In fact, it's stunning. Emotionally, you've certainly faced some challenges, but... Um... Die, then have a life. Here to resume. I mean, really? Mr. Cooper, your life was deep in the toilet, mainly due to the psychological deficits caused by the tumor. That has been fixed, so I would say for the first time in seven years, you actually do have a life to resume. It's gonna be a haul, but I think it's one that you can make. <sighs> All right, let's do this. Come on, I, I really wanna get this over with. Realize for all the Michigas on healthcare, all the money spent on research, development, cures, whatever, we're basically just eating ourselves to death. I don't just mean obesity, but also toxins. That guy that stroked out on Sung's table, the woman that gagged at the restaurant. Do you have any sense the staggering amount of preventable deaths caused either by bad food or cigarettes? You want to solve healthcare? We should impose a fat tax, cigarette tax, a sugar tax. Do you ever stop? No, I don't actually. What are you thinking? It's inappropriate.
So it's true? You come to this hellhole every night? What can I do for you, Buck? I've got a question for you, because you give honest answers. Am I an asshole? Another rum and coke for my man here. Uh, no, I, I don't drink rum. And you want to know if you're an asshole? So, so sorry. 